Greetings, fellow travelers of the ether. It's time for another romp around the planet to see what the latest happenings are in the world of amateur radio. Beaming into your receiver or digital player, we are the planet's premier amateur radio news and bulletin service this week in amateur radio. So let's get the news on the air with a brief summary of what you will hear on edition number 1212 of this week in amateur radio. The 2022 Dayton Hamvention is underway as we come to air this weekend. We will tell you all about it. The Dayton Hamvention also makes available a new app for your mobile device to help navigate the show if you're out there and plan your attendance at the many available forums all weekend. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 is holding a preparatory meeting for their attendance at the upcoming World Radio Conference. We will tell you about a few of their proposals. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Hurricane Center annual communication test is coming up. We will tell you how you can participate. A club in North Florida is holding a simulated cyber attack drill. The AWRL Worldwide Digital Contest will premiere on June 4th and 5th. We will have an in-depth report. Vibroplex acquires Italian linear amplifier manufacturer SPE. We will have the details. The U.S. military is exploring wider use of the HF spectrum in the Indo-Pacific region. We will have information you will need to know. And the Voyager 1 spacecraft. Remember Voyager? The space probe, which is now in interstellar space, is suddenly sending NASA what they call wacky data. We will have all the details coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We will have a humorous look at the world of Hamfest with Oren Brand. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will answer that age-old question this week, why does my home Wi-Fi suck so bad and how can I get better coverage? We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites up there. Australia's own Anil Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, I studied, passed the test, got my call sign, so now when should I go on the air? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at the battery-operated transistor radios of the late 20th century. Can you still get them? Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, covers everything you need to know to install and maintain your tower and antenna installation for your station. This week, Greg covers what you should do if you have to climb your antenna tower at night. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in sunny and hot, it's like 95 degrees, Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our mountaintop outpost in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the temperature is supposed to broach 95 degrees today, and the word of the day is air conditioning, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where it certainly has greened up fairly quickly this week, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where the summer rains have begun, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, where the Angels bowling team is going into extra frames this year. But do they have to bowl all night long? And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, of course, is the Dayton Hamvention. After nearly three years, Hamvention is back. The gates opened at 9 a.m. on Friday, May 20th, for the 70th anniversary of the Dayton Hamvention at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. The 2022 Hamvention theme is Reunion. 
To celebrate the much-anticipated return of this popular annual gathering of the ham radio community after the event's two-year absence in 2020 and 2021 due to the pandemic. Hamvention officials have great reason to expect this year's event will be highly successful. Advanced ticket sales have been brisk, and over 450 vendors have been working this week setting up booths and displays. Around 30,000 visitors are expected to come to the event from all over the world. Michael Coulter, the spokesperson for Hamvention, said that based on numbers from the Greene County Convention Visitors Bureau, Hamvention adds $30 million to the local economy. He said amateur radio is something people of all ages and backgrounds can be part of, which is why he thinks the convention draws such a large crowd. Coulter shared how it feels to bring so many people from around the world together. That makes me feel really good, Coulter told News Center 7's Kayla McDermott. I'm glad that amateur radio seems to be really growing and flourishing, he added. There are no COVID-19 restrictions in place for this year's convention. With thousands of people expected to attend, safety is a top priority. Before entering the convention center, people must have their bags checked. The Greene County Sheriff's Department said they have prepared for the event. Major Sean Prull with the Sheriff's Office said they have a plan in place to make sure traffic moves along smoothly, as there are only two lanes to get to the grounds. Crews will also keep an eye on the weather, in case there's a chance for it to turn severe. Prawl said that this will be his fourth hamvention, and he has never had an incident. We're taking precautions, both that the public will see in uniform presence and also things that they can't see. Just trying to keep everybody safe and be ready for any kind of incident, whether it be weather or man-made or anything like that, Prawl said. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, has organized a large exhibit area, the ARRL Expo, in the Tesla building. More than a dozen booths will be staffed by a team of 80, including ARRL board members, section managers, field organization volunteers, program representatives, and ARRL headquarters staff. ARRLs also organized 10 forums, including presentations for the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, 2022 ARRL Field Day, the ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Program, the ARRL Volunteer Monitor Program, and topics covering ham radio outreach to youth, reinvigorating radio clubs, and understanding the FCC RF exposure rules. An ARRL membership forum will be held Saturday afternoon. The 2022 Hamvention will be open Friday and Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sunday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. For more information, please visit these official websites. For Dayton Hamvention, www.hamvention.org. For ARRL Expo at Dayton Hamvention, www www.awrl.org forward slash expo. Photos will be posted throughout the event on AWRL Facebook page at tinyurl.com forward slash 2022 Hamvention. Dayton Hamvention is offering a free mobile app for smartphones and tablets to help attendees navigate the large scale event. The app, which was introduced in 2019, is offered in a collaborative effort with AWRL the National Association for Amateur Radio. The free ARRL Events app is now available and already includes Hamvention's full program, so attendees can browse and schedule forums, find affiliated events, and preview the extensive list of exhibitors. During the event, attendees can use other app features to follow the hourly prize drawings populated by the Dayton Hamvention Prize Committee and browse building and site maps. Attendees are also encouraged to tap on the My Profile icon in the app to add their name and call sign, email address, and any additional information they would like to share with other Hamvention guests. Additionally, the My Badge icon displays a QR code of the event badge that can be scanned by another attendee or exhibitor using the Scan Badge icon, instantly connecting shared contact information with other hams at the event. The app is available for Apple and Android smart devices or access the web browser version which is optimized for nearly any browser or other type of mobile device. Visit your app store to download the app by searching the term ARRL events or access the links available on the ARRL Expo webpage. The ARRL has announced a new worldwide radio contest recently, the ARRL International Digital Contest. It will take place during the first full weekend in June every year and feature FT8 and FT4 digital modes. Yes, you heard that right. The Amateur Radio Relay League has created a contest for all the FT8 and FT4 digital fans across the world. Here with more details, we go to audio extracted from a video posted by Hudson Division Section Manager Ria Jaram, N2RJ. 
The ARRL has a new digital contest. By digital, we mean FT4 and FT8 and other data modes. This contest will be primarily on the HF bands, basically 160 through 10 meters, excluding, of course, the work bands, which are free of contest. But it will also include 6 meters, which is 50 to 54 megahertz. This seems interesting. Let's dig in. The rules state that you can use any digital mode except for RTTY. By digital mode, the rules really mean to say data mode. This would be modes such as FT4, FT8, JT65, PSK31, Olivia, and so on. It would not include CW or Morse code, which is telegraphy mode, nor will it include digital SSTV because that is an image mode, nor will it include DSTAR, DMR, nor C4FM, as those are primary telephony modes, just so we're clear. And of course, no automated operation is allowed, meaning that each claim contact must include contemporaneous direct initiation by the operator on both sides of the contact. This no automation rule actually is a rule that I wrote into all ARRL contests with the help of my late friend and former colleague, Jim Teamstra, K6JAT. Jim was the director of the Pacific Division, which is basically Northern California, Nevada, and Hawaii. Jim was tapped for AWR president a few years ago, but didn't win the election. He died a few months later. It's tragic because Jim was instrumental in badly needed reforms that AWRL needed and that we got in 2019. So where did this all come from? AWRL already has a contest called the Ready Roundup. It was always called the Ready Roundup, but actually all data modes were allowed. Most of the participants use RTTY, Ready, or Radio Teletype. All data modes being allowed really wasn't a problem, even the weak signal JT modes, such like JT65 being around, because all of the other modes were more cumbersome to use than RTTY. Then along came FT8, and later FT4. FT8 introduced auto sequencing, meaning you can push a button, call CQ, and then someone can respond to you, can automatically pick them up, and then go through the whole exchange with no intervention until it's time to log and recycle back to CQ. This was a bridge too far for many who felt that this gave an unfair advantage to FT8. Of course, there are some who are just anti-progress. Let's just put that out there. FT4 made it even easier, well, sort of, by shortening the transmit cycle of those contacts to seven seconds instead of 15. Even despite all this ease of making contacts, though, I didn't see much of anyone using FT8 or FT4 in the ready roundup. Many veteran contesters were calling for FT8 and FT4 to be completely removed from the ready roundup and all contests. The impact of FT8 was pretty much a shock to the ham radio world. Today, most traffic on the airwaves is FT8, and it's pretty easy to see why. It's easy to operate, can be used with low power and very limited antennas, and yes, some people automate the heck out of it. So clearly something had to be done. The ARRL Programs and Services Committee, being charged with responsibility for radio sport programs, had to look into the matter. Who is the PSC? They're a committee of the board of directors who administer things like radio sport and DXing as well as technical awards. This idea of a separate digital contest isn't exactly new and was floating around since 2019 or so. When I was on the Programs and Services Committee back in 2019, this was an idea, but it kind of took time to develop into what it was today. And this isn't the first time either that there's been a digital contest. Years ago was the PSK Deathmatch. The prize was not a certificate nor any plaque, but an actual sword. Pretty nice, right? Well, that contest died off with PSK 31. I mean, PSK31 is still around, but it's a shadow of its former self. So let's talk about the new digital contest and some of its highlights. This contest will be data modes only, FT8, FT4, PSK31, Olivia, etc. There will be operation allowed on HF bands and 6 meters. This is unique compared to other contests such as the Ridi Roundup or any of the ARRL International DX contests as they only allow HF. The scoring is distance-based. Usually contests are scored based on row points and countries and multipliers. So the first one, data modes, is brand new territory for many veteran contesters. It's also fairly old hat for experienced operators. There will be an interesting route to the top for those establishing themselves in this contest or those who are looking to add yet another plaque to their shack walls. The second one, six meters. This was a careful study done by the contest advisory committee 
There was initially a thought not to include six meters, but later on it was added back. Why? The original contest planned for the contest was in March or April. Later on it was decided that the contest would be held in early June. The report from the contest advisory committee in 2021 said that it would not make sense to have six meters unless the contest was held in June or July. Eventually, when they settle on early June, six meters was added back in. Now, if you know six meters, you will know that this is the time when six meters opens up and all sorts of interesting DX is on the bench. Not only that, but technician licensees can enjoy interesting DX on six meters. But DX isn't the only thing on the band, so that brings us to the next point. Distance-based scoring. This isn't exactly a new concept. There is another contest called the McCrothen Contest, which uses distance as part of the scoring. You do get one point for each contact, plus one additional point for each 500 kilometers of distance between the center of the four-digit grid squares. If you know anything about contesting, you will know that it is extremely advantageous to be on the east coast of the USA in a traditional contest which doesn't have distance-based scoring. This is because you can pretty much win a contest just making contacts with Europe, which is much closer. In fact, now there are a lot of remotely operated stations set up in Maine for this reason. The West Coast has always been kind of left out, and if you talk to some of them out there, they'll typically tell you how tough it is to, to contest from out West. Well, this distance-based scoring sort of evens out the playing field and makes it more possible to win this one from out west. And on six meters, since you're doing distance-based scoring, you can make decent points when the band is open, but even when it's closed, you can still score some points. In terms of power categories, you only have low power and QRP. QRP means very low power. In ARRL speak, low power is now 100 watts and QRP is 5 watts. There aren't any high power categories, which is very interesting. I guess since these data modes are weak signal modes, they don't want to encourage high power operating. I have mixed feelings about that, but it is an interesting twist. There are no single band categories. It's all bands or nothing. You can have single or multiple operators with either single or multiple transmitters. You can do club competition. This is an interesting way to encourage yourself to score more points because if you have a good contest club, you can work with your fellow members and win. You can do team competition, two or more stations within 175 mile circles. Your scores are combined, but you must register before the contest. This is the same contest as the North American QSO party or NAQP. There are even special overlays for indoor antennas, something I've never seen before. So this gives people who live in an apartment or other restricted housing a way to participate and be competitive. What is interesting is that all categories allow spotting assistance. So if you use the DX cluster, you're okay. There are no unlimited categories to worry about. Frankly, I think contest sponsors want to phase those out, but they encounter resistance from the contest community. Multiple signals per band are not allowed. There is software that does this, including WSJTX, which is the official software for FD8 and FD4, but you have to use that in single signal mode. They've also separated out single operator one radio and single operator two radio. And finally, there is an eight hour limited time category. You know, some contesters have said that even 12 to 24 hours is too long for a contest, far less 48 hours. So this will hopefully encourage more participation. What about who can work or contact who? Well, anyone can contact anyone. The exchange, just your grid square. No signal reports, no fake 599s. Everyone gets a certificate if they want, showing their finish, top scores in each AWRL division in Canada and each country other than US and Canada will be awarded plaques if sponsored. You know, this contest seems like it's not just the start of a new era in digital contesting, but it also seems like it is adopting a whole suite of recommendations from the contest community. Many of these ideas I've seen bounce around contest mailing lists and also random ideas. I really hope that this contest can be a good proving ground for these ideas. But the biggest impact will be that data modes are no longer allowed in the RIDI roundup. I'm actually fine with that because there's this whole new playground of data mode contesting and it will be interesting to see who comes out on top. So will you be playing? I might. I think I'll play in the limited time category. Who knows? Until next time, peace in 73. To see the complete video, go to YouTube and search for ARRL Digital Contest on Rhea's Hamshack channel. We thank Rhea and 2RJ for the use of this excerpt.
Vibroplex LLC of Knoxville, Tennessee has entered into a purchase agreement to acquire all operating assets related to the sale and servicing of SPE Expert Linear Amplifiers from Expert Linears America LLC of Magnolia, Texas for undisclosed terms. This is including contractual agreements for the exclusive sale and service of SPE Expert Amplifiers for the United States and Canada. SPE, based in Rome, Italy, has also agreed to provide an extension to existing distribution agreements as part of the transaction. Vibroplex has taken over the exclusive U.S. and Canada distribution and service of SPE Expert products effective May 1, 2022. Present ELA LLC owner Bob Hardy, W5UQ, told ARRL, I'm still doing a lot of repairing, and I will be for a few years until I just can't repair anymore. Hardy will continue to provide repair and parts services for SPE Expert Products on behalf of Vibroplex and function as a consultant during the transition to new ownership. An additional repair person has also been brought on by ELA and Vibroplex to assist with both future warranty and non-warranty service and tech support. All SPE amplifier warranties presently in effect will be transferred to and administered by Vibroplex. Pending orders for SPE expert unfulfilled prior to May 1, 2022 will be administered by Vibroplex with no additional delay over quoted delivery time added. SPE is owned and operated by Gianfranco Scaziafrati, I0ZY, of Rome, Italy. The current SPE product line is distributed worldwide and consists of the SPE 1.3 KFA, the SPE 1.5 KFA, and the SPE 2 KFA solid state linear amplifiers. Scott Robbins, W4PA, owns Vibroplex, as well as Bencher, Inrad, Par Enfeds, and Vintage Manuals product lines. The company is also the exclusive U.S. and Canada distributor for Spider Beam, Matt Tuner, Easy Rotor Control, GHD, and High Mound Radio Accessories. More information is available from Vibroplex, www.vibroplex.com. The high-frequency bands are getting some new recognition within the United States military for its increased importance in national defense. HF Radio is making a comeback for the U.S. military, which has been struggling with reliable means of over-horizon communications in the Indo-Pacific region. That massive region's communications needs are served largely by undersea fiber cables and satellite, both of which are deemed vulnerable to both deliberate and accidental damage. The U.S. Defense Information Systems Agency is eyeing HF as a reliable backup should an interruption occur in either of the other two delivery modes. Officials acknowledge that HF's slower transmission data rate and the military's use of a smaller bandwidth would not make HF ideal for full-time connectivity, but is nevertheless a viable alternative where no other option exists. According to an article in Signal, a publication of the nonprofit AFCEA, testing is already underway in parts of the Pacific that includes Malaysia, Australia, Fiji, and Singapore. The Indo-Pacific Command's Relief Network has been testing HF output as part of its humanitarian assistance and disaster relief work using a transmitter in Oahu. Meanwhile, a combat communications squadron of the United States Air Force based in Guam is working with the single sideband shortwave transmitters of the Air Force High Frequency Global Communications System for voice communication. Elsewhere, modes used in the annual Pacific Endeavor interoperability exercise are being widened to include newer HF technologies for basic data communications. One official told the Signal website that these actions are being taken to expand the mode's reliability. Beyond compensating for satellite and fiber optic vulnerability, officials say they also look forward to the next generation of HF technology. 
which will allow higher speeds and wideband transmission, making full motion video possible for surveillance, airborne intelligence, and related activities from the air. ARRL West Texas Section Manager Dale Durham, W5WI, writes that over the past couple of months, we have learned of several hospitals wanting their staff to obtain ham radio licenses to enable the staff to operate amateur radio equipment placed in the hospital during emergencies. In consultation with retired FCC legal counsel Riley Hollingsworth, and by reviewing Federal Regulation 47 CFR Part 97 in Section 97.113 Prohibited Transmissions Exceptions, we find that the regulation does allow amateur radio licensed hospital staff limited use of the amateur radio equipment for tests and drills only. The regulation spells out the parameters of the limited use. This limited use does not allow amateur radio licensed hospital staff to use the amateur radio equipment during actual emergencies. Amateur radio licensed volunteer groups like ARIES are the best alternative to providing emergency communications for hospitals and other NGO agencies. Some sad news this week as the founder of chipmaker Qualcomm and a long AMSAT supporter has become a silent key. Franklin Antonio N6NKF co-founded Qualcomm, a company whose chips helped spur the success of wearable medical equipment, cell phones, and other tech devices. The lifelong engineer and amateur radio operator was also a generous and enthusiastic supporter of AMSAT. According to the San Diego Union Tribune, Franklin became a silent key recently at the age of 69, and according to several reports, his death was unexpected. His passing was announced on May 13th by Qualcomm, where he'd been a leading force in their engineering department. Qualcomm did not release the date or cause of his death. A philanthropist, Franklin recently gave a gift of $30 million to his alma mater, the University of California, San Diego. He also made a $3 million donation to the Allen Telescope Array for a brand new broadband antenna feed for its work with the SETI Institute, which studies deep space for life beyond Earth. Franklin Road Amps has popular instant track orbital software. Welcome to this edition of the Rain Report. Heard on 160 meters through the spring static crashes on the WA0RCR Gateway 160 meter radio newsletter, which airs for more than 24 straight hours beginning noon Saturday's CDT from Winsville, Missouri on 1860 kilohertz. That's all Saturday afternoon and into the wee hours Sunday on 1860 kilohertz from Missouri. I'm Byron Lee, KC9EEK. The rain office is dark as we go to press, as the all-volunteer staff and the highly compensated rain director have flown the coop to wander the miles of aisles, looking for what's hot and what's not, at the Dayton Hamvention in suburban Trotwood, Ohio. Speaking of the Hamvention, rain's founder and producer, Hap Holly, KC9RP, decided it would be appropriate to blow the virtual dust off a humorous commentary about ham fests that outdoorsman and radio broadcaster Mike Jackson produced for Rain back in 1993. Better known in ham circles as Oren Brand, K9KEJ, this flamboyant and Gene Shepard-esque character wrote and voiced his memorable 8-minute satirical piece about ham fests for Rain more than 15 years ago. If you've been to ham fests in recent years, I think you'll find his observations are still right on the money. See, or rather hear, what you think. With his commentary simply entitled, Ham Fests, here's Oren Brand, K9KEJ. Right at the outset, I will qualify this dissertation by telling you I've been a ham operator since 1957. And I've managed to dabble with many of the facets of our hobby. I've been fortunate to partake in slow and fast scan television, RTTY, AM, SSB, FM, CW, phase modulation, moon bounce, microwave, HF, VHF, UHF, DX, rag chewing, you name it. No, no, pack it, though. I've even toyed with the idea of pack it, but haven't done it. Figured I'd spend enough time in front of a computer screen all day as it is. 
And over the years, I've discovered ham radio has something for everyone, especially for those folks who love to go to ham fests. What? Have I hit a nerve? I'll never forget how I felt at my first ham fest back in the 50s. Don't try to figure out how old I am. I don't even know where it was, except that it was perhaps someplace in central Illinois. There were food stands selling delicious barbecue ribs, Italian beef, hamburgers, fresh sweet corn, and other assorted foodstuffs every normal kid would die for in those days. You could gaze upon row after row of folding tables set up like little communities, almost like dominoes. Looking back now, that first Hamfest experience reminds me of town festivals and celebrations where everyone shows up. Each table held the promise of some kind of adventure. There was a table with used night kits from Allied Radio in Chicago. Stuff like an ocean hopper and space banner super regen receiver. There was a table full of old Heath kits. There were helicrafters, S-38s of various model designations. You know, the S-38, the S-38C, D, E, the whole shot. There were a lot of old HROs. A few Mint Collins receivers, some WRL Globe Gear, maybe a Globe Chief 90A or a Globe Scout 65 or a Globe Champ 300. Many of my friends and I were novices, while also soon after got a tech license to go along with a novice ticket. None of us ever wanted to be labeled as KN9s. Being a K9 brought us respect, despite the fact that hams in their 30s and 40s still called us short pants. Well, anyway, back to the Hamfest tables and the people who set up all that gear. I remember several Chicago area guys with tables loaded with Army surplus stuff. Gear like the command sets, BC-458s, 454s, 455s, 348Qs, 1625s. They filled the tables. Dynamotors, PE-103s, they were converted to run this 24-volt stuff. And if it didn't smell of mildew, my friends, it wasn't authentic. The wild thing was that back then, there was no such thing as a handy talkie. The closest thing to it was a two-meter transceiver made by the Springfield Company that came with a telephone handset, real classy. Try lugging that thing around. As the years went by, the complexion of some of the gear changed somewhat. You could still see a national NC-300 or two, maybe a few Heathkit AT-20s or DX-35s, and hopefully a DX-40 or two, but never a famous DX-100. Those infamous Collins KWS-1s were always sold in private deals, as were the Johnson Viking Thunderbolt kilowatts or Viking Rangers and Valiants. But wait! The lights flash. The earth shakes. And we're transformed through years of strife and upheaval. And it's now 1993. And oh, wait, wait a minute. Hold it. What's that? What's that stuff on the table over there? At the Corn Dancer's Hamfest. My God, it's, it's an old command set. Complete with its built-in antenna tuner, so anyone can load up a wire fence or even a screen. Why, well, there's even a set of extra 1625 tubes. Shh, shh, don't tell anybody. Will you look at that? That's the same guy. The same guy, the same clown selling that same junk from the late 50s and 60s. He's still alive, still around. I'm sure many of you experienced similar happenings. When some of my ham friends and I get together for an evening of dinner and conversation, we often comment that even if any of us haven't attended a ham fest for, say, oh, 20 years or so, we'll still find the same exact people trying to hawk their wares. And we firmly believe that much of that junk on their tables is the same exact stuff that we saw back when we were kids. Now, don't go and get your juices all soured up now about these comments. It's true, and you know it, if you've been around a while. And isn't it amazing how ham fests bring out some of the more, let's say, unusual of our fraternity? I mean, just a couple of years ago, I attended one near Chicago, and sure enough, there they were. A lot of real old-timers I saw when I was a kid, still wearing their hard hats, crumbling civil defense stickers affixed to the front. There they were, the ones with the old GE, or tongues all pocket protectors, with six pens, four pencils, and a metal protractor tucked away, just in case they need to make an accurate measurement of someone's life. My friend and I also noticed that Hamfest seemed to attract the unwashed, unclean, and oftentimes the outrageous of our fellow amateurs. You will definitely see lots of people with huge bellies, rotting teeth, wearing sweat-stained t-shirts that only cover halfway down while also broadcasting bad breath and the worst B.O. ever. There are a salt of the earth folks who will plunk down two G's for some ultra new gear while their kids pick lice out of their hair. Somewhere else, things will be different. 
but my friends, nowhere else in the world will you see a human being with three handy talkies on his person, with two clip-on speaker mics, along with two earphones, one for each ear. I honestly saw one clown with four HTs all going off at once. Get over here quick, he yelled into his mini mic. I think I can get a mint set of Gansa twins for you off this table. I'm in front of for practically nothing. And then someone calls out my name and call letters. And my deepest and darkest fears begin to surface. Someone recognizes me after all. Uh-oh. No, it can't be. He comes running up to me in bib overalls, cowhide boots, four pounds of mud and maybe manure under his fingernails, a beard ZZ Top members would love to have, and an extended hand to me. That hand, by the way, probably hasn't had an intimate relationship with a bar of soap in the last 25 years. Glad to see you, old buddy, he yells over the noise of his dual band talkie. What you doing here? Not wanting to completely insult him, I only shake part of his hand. The fingertips, I believe, to be more sanitized than the rest. I came to see if time really did stand still, as some people claim it does at Hamfests, I explained. And then I saw it, out of the corner of my eye, a flash, a ray of sun glancing off its smooth, shiny exterior. <sighs> like a whoosh. A chrome, vibroplex, semi-auto bug. The Rolls-Royce of CW people worldwide a long time ago. No electronics here, just straight fist pounding. 599, good luck in the contest, 73. I left this guy in mid-sentence and ran across the dirt path to the table with a guy wearing the old white hard hat. How much, I inquired. 300 bucks because it's got new jeweled movements in it, he replied, not being affected by my teary eyes. All right, all right, he then mumbled. I'll give it to you for 200 and that's that. All the way home, my car smelled of mildew, a reminder I had reacquired some great artifact from my past. And at the same time, understanding I truly visited a place where time warps are for real and the ghosts of ham operators past are alive and well, still selling their junk to kids just like me. Happy scavenging. This is Oren, K9KEJ, for rain. And those were the thoughts and musings of Buffalo Grove, Illinois ham, Oren Brand, K9KEJ, better known among outdoors folks for his Mike Jackson Outdoors show. We hope you enjoyed his humorous commentary as much as Hap did digging it out of the rain archives. Now for all of us connected with the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73. This is the Rain Report. Coming up, the answer to the universal question, why does my Wi-Fi suck so bad? And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Nowadays, I have the Wi-Fi router and two more extenders just to attempt to cover my house. With all of this, I still have Wi-Fi problems. All of this is caused by the proliferation of Wi-Fi devices everywhere. TVs, Google Home, Alexa, tablets, phones, smart thermostats, security cameras, garage door openers, light bulbs, etc. The list goes on and on. This is a universal question, partly because, and you nailed it, we ask more of Wi-Fi now than we ever have before. The IoT devices, multiple phones, multiple computers, you might have a dozen or more devices sharing that Wi-Fi access. Uh, I checked myself on my home uh, Wi-Fi network, and I have two networks, one at Euro and one Orbi. I have more than 50 devices. Of course, I'm an outlier, but still... People have a lot of Wi-Fi devices now. Then, of course, your neighbor has lots of them too, right? In fact, if you you know, look at your Wi-Fi menu, you may be seeing a dozen different access points. Some neighbors are, uh, are choosing Wi-Fi routers that say, we're super powerful, double, quadruple, MIMO, and they're interfering more with you than they used to. It all adds up to terrible Wi-Fi. Uh, and and it, it does underscore one particular problem that all Wi-Fi has. It's Wi-Fi's polite. If your access point hears another access point uh -huh, or another device uh -huh, on the network, it'll shut up. It'll clam up. It'll wait a random amount of time, then start again. And if it hears your neighbor's Wi-Fi uh -huh, on the same channel in the same frequency, it'll shut up again. That's why Wi-Fi is so inconsistent. You might even notice pausing. It's it's terrible for uh, streaming video and, and voice calls. Most streaming video is buffering, so it's not as noticeable. But I have to say, when we do our shows with Skype, we tell all of our contributors, 
And whatever you do, you can't be on Wi-Fi. You have to get a wired network, and that's it, that's for that reason. Uh, when it comes to improving your signal, I'm going to refer you a great article from Ars Technica. Jim Salter, who is really a guru of networking, wrote it. It's called The Ars Technica Semi-Scientific Guide to Wi-Fi Access Points. And he recommends them a number of things. I'm not going to go through everything in the article. I would strongly recommend you read it because it's got some great tips for improving Wi-Fi. Tip number one, get a signal meter on your laptop or on your phone. If you have an iPhone, unfortunately, the way Apple works, they don't let third-party apps uh, access the signal strength coming in from the Wi-Fi radio. So iPhones are no good for this. But there are uh, soft, there's programs you can run like NetSpot on your Android device. If you have a laptop, Insider with two S's is really good from metageek.com. So once you get these on a portable device of some kind, laptop is fine, you're going to want to make a map of your Wi-Fi signals. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a Wi-Fi mapping app that I use on Android all the time. Let me let me just quickly check my Android phone because off the top of my head, I it's really handy for getting a sense, making an actual like colored map of all the all the Wi-Fi. It's called Wi-Fi Heat Map. And so, if you have an Android phone, this is a great tool. You walk around your whole house. You'll then have a map with different colors of Wi-Fi. Jim says signal strength. Don't get obsessed about signal strength. Anything better than 67 minus 67 dB is 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 fine. In fact, you can actually have a if it's too strong, if that negative number is too low, like minus 10, it can actually overpower your system and make Wi-Fi worse. So minus 67 is normal. Because that's a negative number, remember, anything lower, minus 66, 65, that's better. Anything higher, 68, 69 is worse. 67 is, Jim says, the cutoff point. You can also, in one of these Wi-Fi tools like Insider, see which bands are most congested. There are 11 bands in the U.S. on any given frequency. Really, there's only three because you have the middle band and the surrounding bands uh, that each channel uses up. And there's, of course three different frequencies there's a 2.4 gigahertz frequency and there's two 5 gigahertz frequencies that wi-fi access points can use it's great once you get a map of everything you'll have a much better understanding of where the trouble spots are in your house but also of which frequencies and channels your devices are using most of your devices can be allowed to pick the channel it's it's really i think an exercise in a futility to try to assign channels. The devices will do, uh, I, and the router will do as, as good a job as you would, maybe better. And they may be moving those around from time to time. The thing to keep in mind is Wi-Fi, and this is a great analogy. I think Jim might have come up with this. Somebody did. Wi-Fi is like a lamp in a room. Uh, you, you get a pool of light from a lamp in a room, but as you go outside the room, that pool of light is weaker. Go through two doors, it's not going to make any difference at all. Wi-Fi is similar to that. A single wall will slow Wi-Fi down. By the time you've got two walls between you and the access point, you've got very little signal coming through. The farther away you get, the slower the service will be to the point where you just don't get any Wi-Fi at all. There's also other obstacles. And the worst obstacle in Wi-Fi is humans. Those big bags of water that are walking around. If Wi-Fi has to go through a human, it's going to attenuate the signal something awful. And you can verify that with your signal meter standing in front of your Wi-Fi access point. Turn your back to it and move the signal meter back and forth. You'll see you really attenuate the signal. That's one reason you want to put your routers, your access points, and your extenders high up. Have them aiming down over the heads of humans, not firing through humans. That seems weird, but in fact, that does make a difference. Higher up is better for an access point. Now, he said he's using signal extenders. Those are the old school way of expanding Wi-Fi. You'd have an access point, and then you'd buy, you know, Linksys access point from Linksys, some signal extenders. The problem with them is they literally cut your Wi-Fi speed in half. And that's because... Half the time they're talking back to the main access point, half the time they're talking to your device. That means they can only transmit to your device about half the time, half the speed. That's why we've mostly gone to mesh systems. Mesh systems generally will have a separate back channel for communicating to the main access point. That doesn't impede the speed 
of the Wi-Fi axis. So you get a very much better performance as you're getting farther and farther away from the main unit using those Wi-Fi satellites if you have a mesh system. At home, I have an Eero. I really like Eero. I have Orbi. Orbi's probably the fastest, but not as sophisticated as the Eero. I know mesh systems are more expensive, but using a mesh system will give you a much better result, in my opinion, uh, than using uh, signal extenders. There's the advantage also that you can add uh, satellites to almost all mesh systems at a lower cost you buy an extra satellite so you can extend it as needed and generally uh, as long as you position the satellites within good range of the main unit you're going to be able to boost your wi-fi farther and farther out so that works pretty well there are a lot more tips that jim has about Wi-Fi, I would recommend reading that article in Ars Technica for all of the ins and outs. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I will give you one more um, a point that might help a lot. Sometimes Wi-Fi just isn't going to make it from this end of the house to that end of the house, uh, in which case you might use a wired solution to expand your Wi-Fi. What? Wired to expand my Wi-Fi? Well, you already have wires in the walls of your house. You have your electrical grid. You also have, probably from your cable television system, you have coaxial cable in the walls. Both of those can be used to extend Wi-Fi. I recommend and I've used the TP-Link uh, home line uh, networking or power line networking devices. They're fairly inexpensive. The way it works is you'll have your Wi-Fi access point, your main router here in, uh, let's say, the living room. By the way, that's one other point Jim mentions is put that as central as possible, obviously, to shorten the distances to the radius instead of the full length of the house. But you've got your centralized Wi-Fi access point. You get one of the little power line adapters, plug it in via Ethernet, then plug it into the wall and as long as you don't have a junction box in between that plug in the wall and another point in the house, you can plug a receiver into the other end. Now these are connected via physical wires, your electrical wires, and it has either a Wi-Fi access point on it, TP-Link makes those, or another Ethernet jack that you could put into one of the satellites. That's one of the nice things about the old Eero system is you could actually put an Ethernet into the satellites to expand your Wi-Fi. still counts as one system, but uh, it's helped out by the wire in the wall. So that's, uh, that's uh, TP-Link. Others make these power line networking. Uh, they're fairly inexpensive, and that's a really good way to expand your network using wiring in the house. I mentioned cable. The coaxial cable can also be used with a system called Mocha, but uh, you'll need to have a little bit more expensive Mocha adapters. Same idea, though, one on each end that's connected via Ethernet to an access point. So before the, all of this is talks, I'm talking about spending money. Before you spend a lot of money on new gear, it's well worth doing an assay of the house and try moving things around a little bit. A couple of things to keep in mind. 2.4 gigahertz is a more crowded band. That's the original Wi-Fi band, but it's the one that goes the farthest. If you're trying to get something outdoors like a doorbell, 2.4 gigahertz is almost always the best choice. 5 gigahertz may work better. It doesn't go through walls as well, but for that reason, there's less interference from neighbors and other Wi-Fi going on in the house. So generally, if you're nearby five gigahertz, uh, an access point or a satellite, five gigahertz is preferable. It's when you're far away that you want to go to 2.4 gigahertz. New gear will always improve uh, your connectivity. There is now a new standard Wi-Fi uh, 6. That's 802.11ax. That has some other features to help solve this problem. Uh, eventually, you're going to get more and more Wi-Fi 6 devices that will be able to take advantage of a Wi-Fi 6 router. So maybe the next time you buy a router, you might want to look at Wi-Fi 6. There's a lot there. It's a difficult challenge. And as any radio engineer will tell you, RF is kind of voodoo science. It's very difficult to figure out where things should be placed. But it, you can off, often improve your signal just by a slight repositioning of the satellites, the access points, and, uh, and of course, your devices. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Yeah. 
Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. In 1954, the radio industry was in turmoil. Television was now in over 50% of American homes and growing rapidly. Traditional radio programs such as dramas, soap operas, situation comedies, and variety shows were dropping fast in the ratings, and TV now had most of the audience. One by one, famous radio stars such as Jack Benny, Burns and Allen, Fred Allen, Groucho Marx, and Jack Webb were abandoning their long-running radio shows and turning to TV. There were still a few holdouts on radio, such as Gunsmoke, with William Conrad as Marshal Matt Dillon, Suspense, The Big Show, and Johnny Dollar, but it was clear that radio was in trouble. Two events in 1954 saved radio. The first was rock and roll, which hit the scene with the release of Rock Around the Clock. The second was a small rectangular box with the name Regency TR1 printed on it. This was the first pocket-sized transistor radio. The Regency TR1 was an electronic revolution. The transistor, which had been developed only six years earlier, was still in its embryonic stage. Regency, with the help of Texas Instruments, was able to produce a four-transistor pocket-sized radio, only five inches by three inches by one and a quarter inches, and sell it for only $49.95. Incidentally, with inflation, that's about $375 today. Other American manufacturers soon jumped on the bandwagon. Raytheon, Zenith, GE, RCA, Westinghouse, Philco, Emerson, and Arvin soon had their own transistor radios on the market. In 1957, Sony introduced their first Japanese transistor radio to the USA. As transistors fell in price, so did the radios. By 1958, a six-transistor imported radio cost only $29.95. With inflation, that's about $180 today. With their Conelrad markings at 640 and 1240 kilocycles, they were initially intended as emergency radios for the typical 1950s bomb shelters. But, with more and more radio stations switching to a top 40 format, teenagers snapped up these pocket radios. The transistor radio became a constant companion of Americans everywhere, from the beach, to the park, to the baseball stadium, and even schools where kids would secretly listen to them in class through earphones. The floodgates really opened in the 1960s. Transistors were now mass-produced and very cheap. Inexpensive off-brand radios such as Real Tone, later Sound Design, Jade, Essex, Juliet, and Viscount were selling everywhere for under $10. Everyone, it seemed, had a transistor radio. I received my first pocket radio, a Jade 10 transistor unit, in bright green, my favorite color, for my ninth birthday in 1962. I attended Catholic school then, and transistor radios were considered contraband by the nuns, who thought that rock and roll was transmitted directly from hell. My beloved Jade was confiscated by my fifth grade teacher in November 1963. On November 22, 1963, the nun removed it from her desk, and our class listened to the news that President John F. Kennedy had been shot. Note, in the ensuing chaos, I got my Jade back, but don't tell the nuns. The pocket radio began to evolve in the late 1960s. More expensive units came with a shortwave band or, more commonly, the FM band. By the 1980s, the AM-only pocket radio was almost extinct. However, the AM-FM units were alive and well. The next evolutionary step came with the Sony Walkman and its imitators. They still had AM-FM receivers in addition to the tape player, at least initially. But as time passed, they lost the AM band, leaving only FM and the tape player. Then came the portable disc player, the iPod, and the MP3 player. For the most part, they didn't include an AM-FM receiver. Slowly, gradually, pocket radios began to disappear from store shelves. I picked up a few Radio Shack flavor radios 
an AM-only pocket radio for $2.97 each at closeout. A few years later, I hit Radio Shack again and purchased several pocket-sized AM-FM radios, also at $2.97 each. I gave some to my kids and relatives and kept two for myself. Then, a few weeks ago, I began to wonder, were there any pocket radios left for sale at traditional stores? Granted, manufacturers such as Grundig, Cato, Eaton, Sanjian, and Sony still sell pocket-sized AM-FM shortwave radios, but these are specialty items and usually only available via the internet. I wanted to know if pocket radios were still available at department, discount, and drug stores, and so I started my search. I was disappointed. My search of the big-name stores, such as Target, Walmart, J.C. Penney's, and Sears, turned up nothing. In the drug, discount, and closeout stores, I did find some pocket radios. However, they were cheap, very poor quality units that were, in my opinion, unfit to be sold. My search was a failure. Then, I walked into my local Kmart. It was on the shelf, in the electronics section, staring at me from inside its plastic clamshell wrapper. It was a Sony ICF S10 MK2, an AM FM pocket radio gleaming under the fluorescent lights. The price was only $9.95. I immediately bought two and rushed home. After cutting through the hard clamshell case, I held the radio in my hand. To me, it was beautiful. It was rectangular, unlike today's oddly shaped radios, and had a clean, uncluttered, straightforward look. It measured four and three quarters by two and three quarters by one and a quarter inches, the same size as the classic radios of the 1960s. The telescopic antenna was 17 and a half inches long. The case was plastic, silver colored. It had an analog dial with slide rule tuning remember that phrase? Volume and tuning controls, an AM FM band switch, a two and a quarter inch speaker, and an earphone jack. The frequency range was 88 to 108 megahertz and 530 to 1600 kilohertz. Note that I said 1600, not 1700. This led me to believe it was new old stock. Although it was assembled in China, the radio was sturdy and well made. It looked like it came out of a time machine, direct from 1973. Next came the performance test. I put in two AA alkaline cells, sorry, no classic 9-volt battery, and turned it on. For my comparison test, I used a Cato 1101. I started on the AM band. The Sony was as sensitive as the Cato and almost as selective. Image rejection and dial calibration were good. As I previously noted, the Sony only goes up to 1600 kilohertz. However, I was able to tune in stations up to 1650 kilohertz. At the band edges, I was able to hear the beacon station JJH on 524 kilohertz and a traveler's information station on 1610 kilohertz, something that can't be done on most of my other radios. The tuning was solid and free of backlash. Overall, I rated the performance on the AM band as very good. On FM, the Sony easily tuned in all local stations. Sensitivity was good, but the AFC circuit sometimes drowned out distant FM stations on nearby frequencies that could be heard on the Cato. Sound quality was crisp and clear, but the two and a quarter inch speaker could not produce the tonal range that the Cato could. Overall, I rated the performance on the FM band as good. With the objective tests over, I then began my subjective review of the Sony. I tuned in a couple of local FM stations that played oldies and listened to the top 40 tunes of yesteryear. Then I went to the AM band and tuned in 740 Toronto, a 50,000 watt powerhouse that for decades used to be the flagship station of the CBC. When the CBC, in an incredibly stupid move, abandoned most of their AM stations in favor of FM, 740 kilohertz was snapped up by private investors. They turned the station into what I consider to be the beacon of the AM broadcast band. The format is an eclectic mixture of big band, jazz, blues, Broadway show tunes, and even rockabilly music, all hosted by 
get this, professional live DJs. The ionosphere cooperated that night, and 740 Toronto was clear as a bell. I closed my eyes and let 740 Toronto and the Sony take me back on a journey from the 1930s through the 1970s. In summary, the Sony ICF S10 MK2 is an excellent value at $995. It outperformed any pocket radio I have ever used. As the ads from the 1960s would say, it's perfect for pocket or purse. And you can't beat the price. $995 today is equal to $2.66 in $1954. The Sony would have blown the Regency TR1 right off the market. This Sony now goes with me everywhere, in my pocket, like it should. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Why fawn over the Sony when the Cato 1101 is a better value? After all, the 1101 is digital, includes shortwave from 3 MHz through 26 MHz, is only 5.5 by 3.5 by 1.5 inches, and is only $49.95 from Universal Radio. I won't argue the point. I agree that there are many quality portable AM FM shortwave radios out there for less than $100. I believe that every ham should have one or more. My concern is this. At a time when an excellent pocket radio is available for less than $10, so few people have one. I was in Lower Manhattan on 9-11-2001, just four blocks from Ground Zero. I was the only one in the crowd outside the Federal Building with a pocket radio, at that time a Sony ICF-10. Later, as I stood in the crowd of 10,000 plus people outside Penn Station, I again was the only one with a radio. People surrounded me as I listened to 1010 Winds for the latest news. Their cell phones were useless, and I was the only one with the latest information. Americans still don't realize that in an emergency, their high-tech toys are worthless, and having a pocket radio can be a lifesaver. My second Sony is still in its plastic clamshell. I'm thinking of buying a Regency TR1 on eBay. I would display it next to the Sony as a testament to the first and possibly the last pocket radio. As a final note, if you have fond memories of transistor radios, there's an excellent website for you. It's called Sarah's Transistor Radios, and the web address is www.transistor.org. Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. The Norwegian National Amateur Radio Society, the NRRL, reports that an International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 interim meeting will take place on June the 23rd, 2022, with activities also on June the 24th and 25th, during the Ham Radio Fair in Friedrichshafen, Germany. Interim meetings of this kind are preparatory meetings held the year before the full IARU Region 1 conference, and the main purpose of the meeting is to prepare matters that are urgent and or are of greater scope. For this year's interim meeting in Friedrichshafen, the NRRL has submitted two agenda items. Firstly, worldwide harmonisation of the 1.8 MHz band, also known as Top Band. This is with a view to proposing, for the upcoming World Radio Conference in 2023, to provide Region 1, in line with Region 2 and Region 3, full access to the frequency range 1800 to 1810 kHz, as well as to remove the power limitations in the upper part of top band, 1850 to 2000 kHz. The NRRL will seek international supporters in this matter. The NRRL is also proposing to open the possibility that IARU Region 1's international meetings can also be held digitally, often as a hybrid between physical meetings and digital meetings. 
There are also other interesting issues that are on the agenda of this interim meeting. For example, the Radio Society of Great Britain is tabling an item about HF band plans during contests. The document summary says that provision for the spectrum usage of both the contest and non-contest community needs to be made by the organisers of major contests, by both member societies and third parties. A proportionate approach that respects the need of both communities is proposed. There is also a revision of the HF band plan, which is being promoted by DARC in Germany and the RSGB in the UK. The background to the document notes the increase in digital mode interests, not only keyboard to keyboard, but also digital voice and digital TV, which the RSGB suggests should be allocated more spectrum. The rationale also suggests that band plan changes should cause amateur activity to spread out more within each band, so that observers of the amateur allocations who might want to make the case to reduce amateur access won't find it so easy to make that case. Another topic is to bring the Harrick Amateur Radio syllabus into the 21st century. This is an important document and case regarding recruitment and the content of the Radio Amateur Licence Curriculum. The documents put forward for the interim meeting can be found at interim.iaru-r1.org. Just head for the interim meeting section. Norway's NRRL will field three participants at this year's interim meeting. HF manager Tom, Lima Alpha 4, Lima November, will appear on the C4 committee, which covers HF matters. General Secretary Bjorn, Lima Bravo 7, Zulu Golf, and Vice President Runa, Lima Alpha 7, Kilo Juliet, will appear as observers. And President Thomas, Lima Alpha 3, Papa November Alpha, will appear on the C5 committee, which looks at VHF and up. International work is important for the radio amateur cause, as well as nationally. Many radio amateur related matters can be discussed by national societies with their local regulator, but issues that need to be discussed at the World Radio Communication Conference, for example, with a view to making changes to the international amateur radio regulations, must often be taken via the International Amateur Radio Union, so that, for example, international support for the case can be obtained. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, up in Seattle, Washington. This week, he reports that solar activity was up, 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 with average daily sunspot numbers increasing from 74.4 to 134.1, and the average daily solar flux from 120.3 to 157.3. To get some perspective, they averaged the weekly averages for sunspot number and solar flux from this bulletin and the previous three reports that we've had, and then compared them to the bulletins from one year earlier. A year ago, the averages for 2021 propagation forecast bulletins were 28.9 for sunspot numbers and 75.9 for solar flux. A year later, the averages are 96.6 .6 for sunspot numbers and 138.4 for solar flux. This documents a substantial increase in solar activity and is another illustration of how this cycle is progressing faster than the official cycle prediction by the experts. So let's take a look at what's going on right now. Geomagnetic indicators were higher this week. The average daily planetary A index went from 5 to 9, while the middle latitude A index increased from 4.6 to 9.6 compared to the previous reporting period, which always runs from Thursday through the following Wednesday. Speaking of Wednesday, SpaceWeather.com reported on that day that sunspot number AR3014 doubled in size, and they reported a massive jet of plasma projected from our sun's northwestern limb. So let's take a look at the predicted solar flux. It is 170 on May 21st through the 24th, then a decline from 168, 166, 150, 136, and a slight jump back to 138, on May 25th through the 29th. Then the predicted values revert back to the Wednesday forecast at 140 on May 30th and 31st, and then back up to 143 on June 1st through the 3rd. Looking at the planetary A index now, it will be 8 on May 21st and 22nd, 5 on May 23rd through the 26th, 5 and 8 on May 27th and 28th, 5 on May 29th, all the way through June 9th. 
And we thank the team of Husiel and Levine of the 557th USAF Weather Wing for this week's predictions. Here is the AMSAT report from Bruce Page, KK5D0. For anyone not at the Hamvention, here is a quick what's happening in the satellite world. The radio in the Columbus module of the ISS is configured for cross-band FM repeater with 145.990 MHz up. PL67 and 437.800 megahertz down. The radio in the service module is powered off. Adrian AA5UK will be operating from the Cayman Islands in EK99 as Zulu Foxtrot 2 Alpha Echo from June 2nd through the 3rd. You can follow him on Twitter at Alpha Alpha 5 UK or the Zulu Foxtrot 2 Alpha Echo. You may be able to rent a car and uh, head over to FK09. Ian. K50M is operating from Hawaii now through May 26th. Wireless Institute of Australian News reports that tens of thousands of Ukrainian mothers and children have left their home without a father, heading to the safety of nearby countries and away from the war zone. Amateur radio was suspended in Ukraine on February the 24th, but now an allowance has been obtained to transmit amateur radio remotely from within the country by using a Ukraine CEPT license as long as the radio frequency emissions themselves are not from Ukrainian soil. As an example of this, well-known Ukrainian amateur Alex, Uniform Tango 5 Uniform Yankee, went on the air on May the 4th as Echo Alpha 4 stroke home call, using a remote station in Madrid, Spain. He also used amateur radio on Ukraine's Mother's Day, when Alex greeted his wife Sasha and his 12-year-old son Daniel, currently living in Finland. This is in line with IARU's theme of Never Alone and showcases the fact that amateur radio has an important role even during the world's most turbulent times. Foundations of Amateur Radio When you obtain your license, there's a whole lot of learning to be had before you even get started with your first transmission. But when you get there, you'll discover that learning has just begun and the rest of your life will be beset with challenges, quests, discovery and dawning understanding. One of the early and recurring questions is around the best time to be on air. Before I get into the why, the answer is right now. This interminable question will continue to haunt you throughout your life, and the most pressing answer will be shaped around the missed opportunity. You'll discover tools that assist with predicting propagation, websites that explain what the various layers of the ionosphere do and how they affect your ability to use the radio to make contact with other amateurs. There's learned discussion around testing and tracking propagation, special modes that help create your own maps for your own station, and you'll discover an endless supply of experts who will advise you when you should power up your transceiver and call CQ. Whilst I've only been an amateur for a short time, in the decade to date I've learned one thing about propagation. Despite all the tools, the discussion, the maps and forecasts, there's no substitute for actually getting on air and making noise. Over the past while I've been watching the propagation from my own shack, using a 200 milliwatt beacon, and I've discovered that running 24 hours a day, every day, well, almost every day, my signal gets to places far beyond my wildest dreams. I've also discovered trends. That is, the average distance of the signal reports is increasing over time. This isn't a linear thing, not even a recurring thing, much like the ebb and flow of the tides varying from day to day a little bit at a time, inexorably making your shoes wet when you least expect it. While to some extent we've tamed the prediction of the tides with complex and interrelated cycles discovered by using Fourier transforms, we are nowhere near achieving this level of sophistication for the ionosphere and its associated propagation. Just like predicting a specific wave is still beyond the capabilities of a tide table, predicting the ability of a radio wave to make it from your antenna to that of another amateur is beyond any tool we have today. Another way to look at predicting the complexity associated with the ionosphere is comparing it to weather forecasting. We have national forecasting bodies with millions of sensors, supercomputing cycles that dwarf most other research, a global network of satellite sensors, roughly a quarter of which have some form of earth sensing capability, transmitting terabytes of data every day and still we cannot determine where on earth it's going to rain tomorrow. The ionosphere, whilst it's being monitored, is not nearly as well resourced. 
It's not nearly as visible to the average person as the packing of an umbrella, and the political perception of need is nowhere near as urgent as getting the weather right. So absent accurate forecasting, finding a better way to determine when to get on air is required. That said, I've discovered that regret is the biggest motivator to get on air. The day after a contest, when a friend made a contact with an amazing station, or the lunch break where I didn't power the radio on to discover a random opening to a clamoring horde of calls looking to make contact. So my best advice to you is to get on air whenever you can. You might not make a contact every time, but you'll discover what the bands look like right now, and you'll have the chance of hitting the jackpot with a rare contact. And truth be told, I think your chances of making a contact are higher than winning the lottery. When you do take that step, you'll start discovering the ebb and flow of the bands, discover the characteristic sound that each band makes, and what a band sounds like when it's open and when it's not. You'll hear stations far and wide discover that while there are trends in propagation, there are no rules. From one moment to the next, you'll discover the thrill of hearing something unexpected. One thing to consider, if you get on air for the sole purpose to make contacts, you're likely going to be disappointed. It's like fishing. Most people don't get up at some crazy hour, sit on a damp jetty, freezing parts of their anatomy off for the sole purpose of catching fish. So, get on air and make some noise. Today. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. In a world of mobile phones, satellites, and the internet, some old-school technology used by spies for decades to send encrypted messages is making a major comeback. With a look at what is being used to get information through to the people of the Ukraine, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report through the Southgate News Service. Canada's CTV News reports that shortwave radio, used by spies for decades to send encrypted messages, is being resurrected for the war in Ukraine. According to Dr. Andrew Hammond, curator and historian at Washington, D.C.'s International Spy Museum, the shortwave radio is a classic tool that was used for espionage. He said that with a shortwave radio, you can transmit information over huge distances. But now, decades later, shortwave is coming back into use. After Russia attacked communication towers in Ukraine, the BBC went old school, broadcasting their news service on shortwave frequencies to counter Russian propaganda about the war. John Figliozzi, a shortwave radio expert and author of the book The Worldwide Listening Guide, said that the BBC is using shortwave radio to transmit the news because it's a lot harder to block those transmissions. It's an old technology, but it works. Used in conflict zones, shortwave is less complicated than other communication avenues and travels further than TV or mobile phones. Radio waves are electromagnetic signals that can be broadcast and for others to tune into by tuning a radio to the correct frequency. Shortwave radios tune into a range of frequencies in the so-called high-frequency or HF bands. When shortwave transmissions are directed at an angle into the sky, they bounce off a layer of atoms in the atmosphere called the ionosphere, allowing them to travel beyond the horizon, much farther than other radio waves such as VHF that are limited by having to transmit in a straight line known as line of sight. Over the past few months, amateur radio hobbyists have used their shortwave receivers to pick up Russian soldiers openly discussing battle plans. Anti-war protesters have also used shortwave radio to troll the Russian military by blasting the Ukrainian national anthem at them or jamming their channels with annoying noises. You can watch the video and read the full story at www.ctvnews.ca. Head for the Science Tech section. While shortwave was used back in the First World War, it became more widespread in the Cold War era when the U.S. and the Soviet Union were highly invested in hearing each other's secret communications and hiding their own. Shortwave changed the way spies communicate, sending cryptic messages on so-called number stations, which were traced to governments all over the world. If you tuned in to one of these number stations at the right time, a mysterious monotone voice would read out what seemed to be random numbers. One of the ways to understand these transmissions was by using a cipher key called a one-time pad, which allowed the intended recipient to crack the code. And it's still used by modern-day Russian spies, including a husband and wife team who had been posing as Canadians for two decades and were arrested in Boston in 2010, inspiring the hit series The Americans. The shortwave radio was unbreakable, Hammond said, so you know that's a pretty powerful tool. But could shortwave make a difference in Ukraine? 
You know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Said Figliozzi. If you need to get through, you're going to try anything. Sending signals and listening with a tool from the past is reborn. In a new YouTube video, Philippe, Foxshot 6 Echo Tango India, demonstrates an amateur radio activity known as Moon Bounce, also known as EME, standing for Earth Moon Earth, which enables worldwide communication at VHF, UHF and microwaves by bouncing signals off the moon. Philippe has been a radio amateur for many years. He communicates around the world using a coding technique that transmits text using a series of short and long pulses, better known as, yes, you've guessed it, Morse code. But now he invites you to watch this video showing how passionate he is about amateur radio, and in particular, moon bounce. And he's got some serious equipment to play with, including his own satellite uplink van. Stay until the end of the video, because the most surprising thing happens then. The video is in French, but YouTube provides a good translation facility, which makes it understandable. While the video is running, simply click on the closed captions icon and the subtitles will appear. Then click on the settings icon and select auto translate and English. You can go to YouTube and watch J'ai Demandé à la Lune, or if you prefer, just search for Philippe's call sign, Foxtrot 6 Echo Tango India. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration National Hurricane Center Amateur Radio Station, WX4NHC, will be on the air for its annual communications test Saturday, May 28, 2022, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 1300 to 2100 UTC. This event marks the 42nd year of amateur radio public service at the National Hurricane Center. The purpose of the event is to test WX4NHC amateur radio equipment and antennas at the center, as well as the center operator's home station equipment, antennas, and computers prior to this year's hurricane season, which starts June 1st and runs through November 30th. WX4NHC Station Assistant Coordinator Julio Ripoll, WD4R, said, The event is a good opportunity for amateur radio operators worldwide to practice providing emergency communications during times of severe weather. We will be making brief contacts on many frequencies and modes, exchanging signal reports and basic weather data with any station in any location. WX4NHC will be on the air on HF, VHF, UHF, and 30-meter APRS and Winlink. We will try to stay on the Hurricane Watch Net frequency of 14.325 MHz most of the time, with an option of 7.268 MHz, depending on propagation and conditions. However, we will be operating on different frequencies depending on QRM. You may be able to find the operation on HF by using one of the DX spotting networks, such as the DX Summit. The operation will also be conducted on the VOIP Hurricane Net at 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 2000 to 2100 UTC on IRLP mode 9219 Echolink WX Talk Conference Node 7203. WX4NHC operators will also make a few contacts on local VHF and UHF repeaters, as well as the Florida statewide SARNET system to test station equipment. QSL cards are available via WD4R. Please send cards with an SASE. Please do not send QSL cards directly to the Hurricane Center address as handling will get delayed. Due to security measures and the COVID-19 pandemic, no visitors will be allowed entry to the National Hurricane Center. For more information about WX4NHC, please visit the station's website. German radio amateurs have been given a grant of 249,424 euros, or roughly $260,000, by Amateur Radio Digital Communications Group to develop software that will allow the use of global system for mobile communications, known as GSM, and General Packet Radio Service, or GPRS, technology on amateur radio bands. 
A post by the ARDC reads in part that open source mobile communications, known as Osmocon, is an umbrella project fiscally sponsored by the Deutscher Amateur Radio Club that hosts, develops, and maintains mobile communications and SDR open source projects with a main focus on cellular telephony systems. Osmocom identified a gap between the last decade of very promising open source developments in cellular technology and the requirements of being able to use this in the context of amateur radio. This grant will be used to develop software that will allow the use of GSM and GPRS technology on amateur radio bands by implementing a SDR PHY that can be plugged beneath the existing Osmocom BB code to allow its use on general purpose SDR hardware such as the Lime SDR or USRP series of radios, which will add basic support for packet switched GPRS services by Osmocom BB. Osmocom developers will utilize their long-term experience developing open source software for mobile communications to carry out the project. Any developments made within this project are developed as part of existing free open source software projects published under licenses recognized by the FSF Free Software Definition and the OSI Open Source Definition. The entire development process happens in the Osmocom community using publicly accessible resources such as Redmine Issue Tracker, Garrett Code Review Platform, mailing lists, IRC channel, etc. Once completed, the work within this project will pave the way to a potential subsequent development of eight PSK-based technologies in order to significantly increase the achievable packet data rates within the same narrowband channel. We have late breaking news. The North Florida Amateur Radio Club officer, Gordon Gibby, KX4Z, reports that the Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 4, which is Alabama, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Tennessee, and also FEMA Region 6, which is Texas, Arkansas, New Mexico, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, emergency communications coordinating working groups are planning a cyber attack exercise on June 1st, 2022. Several major metropolitan areas will be cited as the affected areas, and both CISA shares and amateur radio WinLink will be used to provide ground truth information back to the appropriate sources. We radio amateurs are only a portion of this wide-ranging exercise that includes multiple federal and state communications reporting systems, said Gebby. It's a fairly simple collection of ground truths for a simulated cyber attack on a limited number of high population centers, he said. The WinLink response is requested from both CISA shares, personnel, and radio amateurs. The exercise involves creating a single message in a specific WinLink template addressed to specific recipients, not unlike the ETO's WinLink Thursday exercises. The message can then be sent using Telnet or any desired radio technique such as RDOP, VARA, or Pactor. This is an excellent opportunity for amateur radio operators to provide critical information from their home locations and ARRL and ARIES will be involved. The 2022 Armed Forces Day Crossband Test held on May 14th produced impressive results this year. Frank Donovan, Whiskey 3 Lima Papa Lima, reports good band conditions and participation resulted in over 800 contacts with 330 on single sideband. Cooperation of amateurs as secondary users on 60 meters was outstanding, with no interference, said Donovan. All of the 24 stations that signed up for the exercise were active at some point. Here is the detailed NSS band-by-band -band QSO breakdown. On 80 meters, 20 on CW, 35 single sideband for a total of 55. On 60 meters, 21 CW, 169 on single sideband for a total of 190. On 40 meters, 85 on CW, 87 on single sideband for a total of 172. On 30 meters, 54 CW for a total of 54. And on 20 meters, 151 on CW, 165 on single sideband for a total of 316. All that calculates out to 331 contacts on CW, 
456 contacts on single sideband for a grand total of 787 contacts. Historic U.S. Navy call sign November Sierra Sierra in Annapolis, Maryland was operated by the U.S. Naval Academy Amateur Radio Club, supported by members of the Potomac Valley Radio Club, and produced 331 CW and 456 single sideband contacts from the location of the 1918 NSS Naval Radio Station. NSS QSL cards are available from K3LU. A self-addressed stamped envelope will be appreciated. Let's ease you in with a very interesting piece of new research which is using the benefits of amateur radio to support professional study. I say benefits. Well, for a start, there are ham radio operators all over the world. Or, if you look at it globally, they effectively form one huge antenna. And secondly, they come free and willing. If you can get many of them to report back on a particular propagation effect, you've got a crowdfunded database on a massive scale. So when it was discovered that amateur radio observations of space weather correlated well with professional figures, a new study was born. Gang Lu, the editor of Geophysical Research Letters, references in edition 49 to a study where amateur radio observations are providing a novel new method for studying large-scale ionospheric disturbances and HF communication impacts, and are important applications in ionospheric space weather monitoring. Large-scale travelling ionospheric disturbances are variations in the ionosphere with wavelengths greater than 1,000 kilometres and periodicities between 30 minutes and 30 hours. Ionospheric electron density fluctuations associated with these disturbances directly affect radio wave propagation passing through the ionosphere and thus can be detrimental to telecommunication and satellite navigation systems. In this innovative new research, Nathan Frissell and his associates show how crowdsourced amateur radio observations can be used to study the continental scale ionospheric disturbances in the near-Earth space environment. They found that the large-scale travelling ionospheric disturbance signatures in the amateur radio data are well correlated with the observations made by professional scientific instruments such as high-frequency coherent scatter radars and ground guidance signal processor receivers. The study demonstrates that citizen science observations are vital to ionospheric research and monitoring. W1AW, the Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Station located at ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut, is fulfilling QSL card requests with a commemorative card celebrating the Amateur Radio Transatlantic Communications Centennial. The special card will be issued for all W1AW QSL card requests for contacts made with the station from December 11, 2021, to December 31st, 2022. The historic transatlantic tests of 100 years ago contributed to the dawn of international amateur radio communications. U.S. amateurs contacting W1AW who would like a QSL card should send their card directly to the station with a self-addressed stamp envelope. International stations may confirm receipt of transmissions directly to W1AW with one IRC or via the W1 incoming QSL bureau. In 1896, Marconi came to the UK to conduct his radio wave experiments after trying and failing to get interest in his work from his own Italian countrymen. His assistant, George Kemp, was from Cardiff and suggested the Bristol Channel would be the perfect place to make tests. On the 11th and 12th of May 1896, Marconi's team placed a transmitter on Flat Home Island, an island halfway across the Bristol Channel, and began sending messages out into the airways, hoping to reach their receiving station set up at Lavernock on the coast of South East Wales. Their work was a failure. The team member in Lavernock sat waiting for a non-existent signal. But then, on the following day, the 13th of May, the receiving instruments rang out with a clear spark. Marconi sent a message in Morse code saying, Can you hear me? which was received loud and clear. Immediately, the transmitting team travelled back to Breen Down Fort, just south of Western Supermare on the English mainland, and set up again to test over the greater distance. A further message was sent and successfully received over a distance of nearly 10 miles, a record at the time. 
Dave Dyer, chairman of the Western Supermare Radio Society, commented that before Marconi, one had to use telegraph wires to contact people, but with radio, you could contact ships instantly. Mr. Dyer took the sinking of the Titanic as an example. The ship was able to send a distress call out, and it saved so many lives at sea. During the ship's sinking, wireless operator Jack Phillips sent out a CQD message to ships nearby, a precursor to the SOS signal now used. Mr. Phillips, a Marconi company employee, went down with the ship as he continued to broadcast and died in the disaster. Britain's Postmaster General of that time, Herbert Samuel, said that those who had been saved had been saved through one man, Mr. Marconi, and his marvellous invention. Once again, the best Hamvention souvenir is one of the least expensive and most useful. It's the 2022 Hamvention lanyard, available from the Boy Scouts Venture Crew 73, led by George Ewing, WD8NHI. As you get ready to pass inside the main gate at the Green County Fairgrounds, look for the Venture Crew tent. Go inside, and for just $5, you can get your Hamvention 2022 lanyard and have your Hamvention ticket laminated to hang around your neck. No more fumbling for your ticket at the entrance to the tents and buildings. Your ticket is right there and visible for security to see. Best of all, you can't lose your ticket. While you're at it, go ahead and get the full color Hamvention 2022 patch from the Scouts, also for just $5. This patch features a loop so you can hang it securely from, you guessed it, your lanyard. If you're in too much of a hurry to get inside the gate, you can pass by booth 4011 in the building with the prize drum and get your lanyard and patch there. It also makes a great gift for your ham friends who couldn't make it to Hamvention this year and as gifts for the next club meeting or prizes for the next ham fest. Support Venture Crew 73 and get one of the most useful and least expensive items at Hamvention. Foundation license holders in the United Kingdom can earn certificates and encourage them to move forward in their on-air activities and progress towards intermediate and full license level. Radio Society of Great Britain is calling on the incentive program Brickworks because of its goal to build on the foundation. Its national release two years ago was slowed by the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns, so the Society is breathing new life into it by actively encouraging clubs and individuals to sign up. With the assistance of local clubs, newcomers can mark their achievements by attending club meetings, writing software, undertaking construction projects, logging QSOs, and getting involved in contests. Yes, even making a cup of tea for the next club meeting counts towards points, Certificates are available at the silver, gold, platinum, and diamond level. If you're interested in joining the program, contact your local Brickworks Club. There's a searchable map that serves as Brickworks Club Finder, showing locations throughout the UK. Clubs are being encouraged to contact the RSGB to register and become accredited for the Brickworks program. Previously registered clubs do not need to re-register. Find the map and other details at rsgb.org stroke brickworks. Spectators watching the New River Marathon on Saturday, May 14th, applauded the winners as they crossed the finish line, but some of the biggest honors went to the Ash County Amateur Radio Club. Operating at the North Carolina race for the first time, club members provided real-time status of the racers and kept a close watch on competitors in distress. Paul Raish, N1XI, Club president said 11 amateurs covered nine support stops, operated two roving vehicles along the race routes, and maintained a base station at the finish line. Operators used mobile radios on two-meter simplex with at least 50 watts of power. The base station had a vertical antenna raised 20 feet high. Because this was the first time the club was responsible for coverage of the race, everything had to be just right. Paul said that even when something went wrong and one runner could not finish the course, the hams were able to get her within minutes after being notified that she needed help. Paul said the race director, Kevin Savinsky, told them afterwards he heard nothing but great things from both runners and volunteers about the job our club did. We're hopeful that we will be invited back next year, and our goal then will be to do an even better job than we did this year, Paul said. 
In radio sport contesting for May 21st, there's one on tap for May 21st to the 22nd. That's the SARL VHF UHF Digital Contest. Then on May 21st, the UNDX Contest, CW or phone there. On uh, the 21st also, the Yoda Contest, CW or phone. May 21st to the 22nd, Nazart Sangster Shield Contest, CW. May 21st to the 22nd, His Majesty King of Spain Contest. And on May 25th, the SKCC Sprint CW. And for upcoming conversations and conventions at HamFest, June 3rd through the 5th, CPAC hosting the ARRL Northwest Division Convention. That's in Seaside, Oregon. June 4th, the Atlanta HamFest hosting uh, the ARRL Georgia State Convention in Marietta, Georgia. And on June 18th, Knoxville HamFest, an electronic convention hosting the ARRL Tennessee State Convention in Knoxville, Tennessee. GNU Radio is a free and open source software development toolkit that provides signal processing blocks to implement software radios. It can be used with readily available low-cost external RF hardware to create software-defined radios or without the hardware in a simulation-like environment. It's widely used in research, industry, academia, government and hobbyist environments to support both wireless communications research and real-world radio systems. A paper by Daniel Estefeth, Echo Alpha 4 Golf Papa Zulu, Mario Lorenz, Delta Lima 5 Mike Lima Oscar and Peter Gordsoff, Delta Bravo 2 Oscar Sierra, describes the deep space reception of the Tianwen-1 Chinese Mars mission using GNU radio, carried out by AMSAT DL with the 20 meter antenna at Bochum Observatory in Germany. A real-time GNU radio decoder was used to receive and store telemetry from the spacecraft almost every day over the course of 10 months. Some of the telemetry variables, such as the trajectory information, have been successfully interpreted and used to track the progress of the mission. A PDF download, Deep Space Reception of Tianwen-1 by AMSAT DL using GNU radio, is available from AMSAT DL. This paper was published in the Proceedings of the GNU Radio Conference 2021 and recently published together with other papers in the area of radar, signal detection and classification, high rate processing and sensing. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Over the years I've been a tower climber, I've had to work at night. When I tell people I climb at night, I usually get more comments from that than I do from climbing in general. Most of the towers I've been on are close to populated areas, and since most populated areas are full of street lights, I've noticed that most of these towers are easily seen at night, and I often do not use my headlamp while climbing up the tower. Now this may only apply to towers less than 200 feet tall, or job sites on the tower lower than 200 feet. Since the light from street lights shines upwards, even a small of amount of light is usually makes the tower stand out boldly against a black sky. Now it may not appear when you first arrive at the tower that it's easy to see, but after your eyes adjust to the dark, it will become a lot easier. When climbing downwards, the lighting is different, and here is where I use my headlamp. I wear a headband type flashlight I purchased at our local Walmart for about $8. I also bring along extra AA batteries. If you were going to do a job that would last more than 20 minutes or so, or higher than ambient light would allow you to climb upwards without extra light, I would recommend a style of light with an external gel cell type battery. Also, a surprising amount of light can come from the moon. And when you get above the street lights, you may be surprised how well you can see with no added light. Some climbers do not like to work on wet towers, which is understandable. Lots of times at night, dew forms on towers, which can make them dripping wet. And I've noticed over the years that this wetness usually only goes to about 20 or 30 feet or so above the ground and then stops. Some of the best scenery I've seen is late at night on a tower. At night, fog can make the visibility poor on the ground, but often stops before you get to the spot on the tower you need to get to. Climbing above the fog on a night with a full moon can provide some spectacular views as the fog looks thick enough like you could step off the tower and walk on top of it. Too bad this would be nearly impossible to photograph. Finally, I've noticed that Mother Nature tends to calm down at night, say after midnight. 
If there's a job you've been needing to get done, but wind or storms have kept you off the tower, check out the weather after midnight, then give it a try. Don't forget that ground crew, and never climb alone, especially at night. Also, don't forget extra batteries for your flashlight, and don't use the kind of flashlight you hold in your hand. Spotlights on the ground will only blind you on the tower, so don't let people shine lights up at you. When I do a night job, I often call the local police to let them know I'll be there so I don't get a light shine in my eyes. Plus, if they're bored and the donut shops are closed, they may even offer to be a ground crew for you. Now remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. You can email me about this subject at fmgreg at yahoo.com. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Hams in Australia have a new tool to help them calculate the apparatus license fee for their shacks. The Australian Communication and Media Authority has made a fee calculator available to help find what the ACMA is calling the most cost-efficient license option for amateurs and holders of other radio licenses. The fees relate to the operation of a radio frequency transmitter or receiver. The ACMA has said that the calculator will receive regular updates with respect to pricing and other options. You can find the new calculator at www.openspec.com.au slash fee dash calculator. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copy sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, remember Voyager? The Voyager 1 probe launched in 1977, and now humankind's most distant object is transmitting data that doesn't make sense. The Voyager 1 probe is still exploring interstellar space 45 years after launching, but it has encountered an issue that mystifies the spacecraft's team on Earth. Voyager 1 continues to operate well despite its advanced age and 23.3 billion kilometer distance from Earth. And it can receive and execute commands sent from NASA as well as gather and send back science data. But the readouts from the Attitude Articulation and Control System, which control the spacecraft's orientation in space, don't match up with what Voyager is actually doing. The Attitude Articulation and Control System, or AACS, ensures that the probe's high-gain antenna remains pointed at Earth so Voyager can send data back to NASA. A mystery like this is sort of par for the course at this stage of the Voyager mission, said Suzanne Dodd, project manager for Voyager 1 and 2 at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California in a NASA release. Due to Voyager's interstellar location, it takes light 20 hours and 33 minutes to travel one way, so the call and response of one message between NASA and Voyager takes two days. So far, the Voyager team believes the AACS is still working, but the instrument's data readout seem random or impossible. The system issue hasn't triggered anything to put the spacecraft into safe mode so far. That's when only essential operations occur so engineers can diagnose an issue that would put the spacecraft at risk. And Voyager's signal is as strong as ever, meaning the antenna is still pointed to Earth. The team is trying to determine if this incorrect data is coming directly from this instrument or if another system is causing it. Until the nature of the issue is better understood, the team cannot anticipate whether this might affect how long the spacecraft can collect and transmit science data, according to a NASA release.
The spacecraft are both almost 45 years old, which is far beyond what the mission planners anticipated. We're also in interstellar space, a high radiation environment that no spacecraft have flown in before. So there are some big challenges for the engineering team. But I think if there's a way to solve this issue with the AACS, our team will find it. If the team doesn't determine the source of the issue, they may just adapt to it, Dodd said. Or if they can find it, the issue may be solved by making a software change or relying on a redundant hardware system. Voyager has already relied on backup systems to last as long as it has. In 2017, the probe fired thrusters that were used during its initial planetary encounters during the 1970s, and they still worked after remaining unused for 37 years. The aging probes produce very little power per year, so subsystems and heaters have been turned off over the years so that critical systems and science instruments can keep operating. Voyager 2, a twin spacecraft, continues to operate well in interstellar space 19.5 billion kilometers from Earth. By comparison, Neptune, the farthest planet from Earth, is at most only 2.9 billion miles away. Both probes were launched in 1977 and have far exceeded their original purpose to fly by planets. Now they have become the only two spacecraft to gather data from interstellar space and provide insights about the heliosphere, or the bubble created by the sun that extends beyond the planets in our solar system. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, 